Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Pete and Tom. Uh, we're giving the talk on breakthroughs in spatial audio technologies here at OC4. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a technical difficulty on the first 15 minutes of our talk. Pete and I are re-recording that first 15 minutes, and as soon as we go back to the recorded version, we'll just dive back into what it was actually said there. Thanks, Tom. So this talk, we called it Breakthroughs in Spatial Audio, because we've got some big new features that we're really excited to talk about. And the first one is volumetric. Uh, that's making sounds really big and spreading them out. And the other one is near field, and that's making close sounds sound close to you. But before we get into all of that, we want to cover the basics of spatial audio and kind of describe where the state of the technology is right now so we can talk about some of the things we're changing and doing a bit differently to achieve these new effects. So spatial audio is designed to reproduce 3D audio through stereo headphones. And with VR, we've got a really unique opportunity to do this because we've got head-tracked headphones. So we can provide the binaural cues to create a full 3D sound. Um, and we do this with object-based audio using head-related transfer functions. And there's a couple of pieces to this. So the first part of it is directionality. And so there's three main cues that are used to provide that sense of directionality. The first is the interaural level difference. A sound that's on my left side is going to be coming through a lot louder in the left ear than it is on the right ear. Now, this is due to the shadowing of the head, that the head is blocking that sound from hitting the right side. And this is a little different to how it worked previously with panned audio, which is more designed for speakers. So in a panning case, if you have stereo and a sound's on the left side, it'll just be hard panned to the left. So this can actually be a really useful thing to know uh, if you're debugging a situation. Um, so say you've got a complex setup in your project and you're not sure if all of your sounds are being spatialized, um, you can turn your head side onto it and so the sounds to your left and if you're hearing nothing coming out the right side or you're only hearing the reverb, then you know it's not actually being spatialized correctly, it's fallen back to panning. This was super helpful when we made Farlands. Um, we spatialized every single thing in that game and we realized that the talking robot at some time, I was like, there's something off about it, it doesn't sound quite right. And it turns out it was only panning. Uh, Pete showed me this trick, and it's been super helpful in debugging things that somehow missed the, the 3D spatialized panner. So that's how the, the levels work in um, spatial audio. The next major cue is the time difference. So um, that sound on my left side is going to arrive at the left ear before it arrives at the right ear. And there's about a millisecond or so of difference there. And it's very small, but it's enough for the brain to pick up and really enhances that directional cue. And this is important for what I'll be talking about later as well. So keep in mind that there's that time delay involved with spatialization. And then the third component that brings it all together is this spectral difference. So that sound on the left side is going to be coming through pretty clearly in the left ear, but because it's blocked and sort of bending around the head to get to the right ear, you're going to have a very different frequency response. And this is mostly the loss of the mid to high frequencies. Um, you can see in this graph that you've got sort of red and white coming through the left ear. It's coming through more loudly. And before it arrives at the right ear, where you've got a later signal, and it's mostly just the low end with those low frequencies that can reach while those right ones are being blocked by the head. So all of these three cues, they come together and they give you that sense of direction. You can put a sound anywhere, up, down, below, left, right. But you need to push it away into the distance to really f create that full 3D scene. So I'm going to talk about some of the distance cues that are used with the current state of spatial audio. So the first and most notable one is attenuation. Obviously, sounds get quieter as they get further away from the listener. Now, this is only really meaningful if you have context for the sound. So if you don't know what the sound is, you don't know how loud it's meant to be normally. But if I say here a car that's really quiet, I know that that car's far away because cars are generally quite loud. If I hear a mosquito that's really loud, then I know that's really close because mosquitoes are very quiet. But if it's a synthetic sound, then you may not have that frame of reference, so the loudness or the volume of it is not enough just to give you that sense of distance. Another cue is air absorption. This one's super subtle. It'll be 1 or 2 dB over hundreds of meters. Most people don't bother modeling this. Um, and again, you need that frame of reference. You need to know how much high frequency content was in the original sound to know that it's missing when it's further away. Now reflections. This is more unique to spatial audio, at least making an effort to do them right and the reflections really enhance the spatialization so as well as giving you a good sense of distance about how much is bouncing around and, and where those bounces are coming from you're also getting that sense of 
the room that you're in and the size of the space. And you're also enhancing that directionality cue as the sound bounces around coming from other directions, those bounces. And then you've got the reverb. Now this has been used for a very long time. This is even in linear media, music and everything that to push things back in the mix and make it sound further away, you just add more reverb. And it's that wet dry balance that really gives you that sense of distance. And this is a really important cue. And you've also got a bit of pre-delay there as well that if you're hearing the sound and then the reverb, then it sounds like it's quite close to you and it's bouncing off later. If they're kind of coming in all together and you're getting a lot of reverb and it's all sort of indistinguishable, then the sound's way off in the distance. So that's basically where we are with spatial audio right now, that we can model anything and put it at any distance in theory. But there are a couple limitations here. One of those being is that the HRTF itself is measured in the far field. And a lot of the assumptions of the HRTF are about far field reproduction. So all of these distance cues work at a distance, but once you bring things in closer than about a meter away, which is about three feet, then the spatial cues start to break down. The other limitation is that you, um, the HRTF is measured as point sources. So they use a very small speaker spaced about a meter away to measure the HRTF, and it's designed for reproducing point sources. So these are the two limitations that we we're looking to address with these new features. So the first big feature we're going to be talking about is near field spatialization. So the way we did near field is we needed a way to simplify the method because the HRTF cues change as you get closer to the listener. So if we were to measure this, we'd have that initial measurement at about a meter away, and then we need to take subsequent measurements closer and closer. And this becomes problematic. Not only is it an increase in data size and complexity of the algorithms, but it's also very difficult to measure that accurately because the size of the speaker is increasing relative to that distance. So it's very hard to accurately measure and it's very hard to accurately reproduce this way. So we're looking for a much simpler approach to approximate the spatial audio cues of near field. So there's a couple of things we changed about the way we do the HRTF. So if a sound is really far away, you can just measure the angle from the center of the head and assume the angle to both ears is gonna be roughly the same. But as the sound gets closer and closer, the angles are changing and they're not lining up correctly. So the first step was to move from a head-centric lookup for the HRTF, where we just grab the left-right pair, to an ear-centric model, where we do an independent lookup for the left and the right ear to make sure we're getting the right directional cues for each ear. So that brings us part of the way there. But that isn't going to give us a perfect near-field spatialization because the cues themselves change as a function of distance as well. And this primarily shows itself as being an exaggeration of that head shadowing effect. So as the sound gets closer and closer, you're getting more and more head shadowing. And so this diagram here kind of shows that head shadowing effect. So if you take a six kilohertz signal that's shown here, it's quite a high frequency and the sound's basically gonna be blocked by the head. And you just get this really strong acoustic shadow. If you look at a lower frequency like 200 hertz, this is going to diffract around the head, so that's like bending around, and a lot of that signal is still going to reach the ear because it's such a low frequency and a long wavelength. So we have a hand-tuned low-pass filter that we're applying to the HRTF as well that simulates this exaggerated shadowing in the near field, and this combined with the ear-centric lookup gives a really convincing sense of near field spatialization. And so all of these um, technologies that we develop for the audio SDK, we test them in the Rift with the headset while we're developing them. And so we've got a really bare bones test bed that we use for that, that we've set up in Unity. And it's really simple, it's just a cube, but we needed some really great sounds to make this work. And so we turned to Tom's team for help with this. So yeah, this was kind of fun. We were trying to figure out what sounds best in VR, like what sounds close near to your head. Um, the first thing we thought of was the old razor demo for the HRTF. So we got an electric razor. Uh, we cut, tried to cut hair, tried to cut our dog's hair, tried to cut everything. But, you know, that wasn't really working. So we ended up cutting some paintbrushes. So we cut the paintbrushes like zzz, zzz, as we go through the paintbrushes. And it was kind of cool because we got a real visceral reaction when people were putting the, the touch controller where the sound was coming from with absolutely no visuals and they put it close to their head and you saw, saw them like give a little bit of a shiver like they would turn their head away like they were afraid their hair was actually getting cut. The next thing we did was whispering. Whispering was fantastic. Um, we got somebody in our office, Anna, to come in and just whisper something 
kind of plain and normal, uh, just like this is the sound of a human voice. And it kind of tripped people out because once again, with no visuals and only a sound, a whispering voice coming from a touch controller in an all black environment, and you moved the, the whisper close to your ear, it felt like it was invading your personal space. Um, afterwards, it was amazing. People couldn't even look at Anna anymore in the office. They're like, no, you were too close to me uh, and you were in my space. But, you know, this was all done in just VR with the near field stuff. And it really caused an ASMR reaction because you saw people get the little tingles in their back and they were just like, oh, I, I don't like this. So that was pretty awesome. The third thing we did was a mosquito. As Pete was talking earlier, mosquitoes are small and tiny and you don't hear them because they're extremely quiet when they're far away. And so when they're close to you, to know that, you know, you could get bit because there's a mosquito right next to your ear. People also got the reaction, like with the head moving away from the controller because the mosquito was too close to them. So all these were just showing how powerful near field HRTF is. Yeah, these were really great and the sounds were great and they really gave you a strong reaction. And we want to show you a little bit here of that test bed. Now, this didn't translate over the system uh, that we were talking to the PA, but if you're listening with headphones on YouTube, this is going to come out really well. So um, make sure you got your headphones on and have a listen. It's going to be better in VR, but this will give you a feel for how this stuff works. So that worked really well. Um, it was really fun to develop this and we got some really great reactions. Uh, this is really powerful technology and our real focus with everything we make is to make it easy to use and we know to make the workflow really, really simple so people can easily adopt this. So we optimized it, we made it pretty much free compared to the normal spatializer. There's no extra perfect for near field and all you need to do is drop it in. So we gave it to Tom's team. So, so I work in a team up in Seattle called the Oculus Rex team. We're the ones who make all the first demos you see when you're in Oculus. So we made Dream Deck, and we made Prologue, and we made Toy Box, and we also made First Contact. First Contact was pretty cool because it was the first time people got touch controllers. The whole thing was designed to be close to you in an enclosed space, and with Near Field worked really well on this because if you think everything that you can reach and touch is within that three-foot you know, radius around you. So that's where, it, where it's the most powerful. So here's a little trailer of First Contact so you can see what it looks like. Okay, so that was first contact. As you can see, there's a lot of handheld uh, toys to play with. Like there's uh, jingle bells and there's little butterflies that fly around you. There's a rocket ship that zooms past your head. Um, we had somebody come visit us up in the Seattle office to talk to us about our near field and volumetric uh, tools that, that Pete's team came up with. And they had done some VR before, but they had never done first contact before. So when they got done with first contact, they took off the headset and they just had to sit there. And Pete and I wanted to keep talking, but he was like, no, I need five minutes. I just need to recover from that. Now, I know first contact was a really powerful experience, but I think we made it even better with Nearfield because it just kind of added that much more. He was trying to listen to audio and just was just so wrapped up in the experience. You can tell he quit listening to audio and just enjoyed the experience. And as a sound designer, that's what we want. We don't want you listening to the audio. We want you just enjoying it and feel like you're actually there and being immersed. Also, for doing for updating First Contact, all I had to do was grab the latest SDK, plug it in, rebuild my Wise Banks, and Nearfield was there. There's no settings. There's nothing to do. It just works. The Nearfield works for anything within that three foot radius. Okay, now uh, we're talking about whispering. So whispering's kind of crazy. How strong and powerful it is. So 
as I said, in the test room that you saw earlier, it was just a voice coming from a touch controller. And I believe it's just a dot or a circle or a square. And there's a sound coming from it. And people held it up to their ears and they, they shivered and they got a really uncomfortable experience from it. And that's awesome because as a sound designer, you want these tools that are super powerful. So use this in a horror game, use this in a ghost game, but be super careful with it too because you don't want to be doing a social interaction game and then have somebody really close to you and be just invading your personal space. It's very uncomfortable, but it does create incredible immersion and it's a very incredible tool to use and just makes VR that much better. Hey everybody, thanks for listening so far. Pete's about to come back on. We'll have our live audio working in a second and he's going to talk about volumetric sounds. Thanks. worry about the performance or anything, it's really high performance. Now, Pete's going to go on and tell you about the next thing, which is volumetric. Yeah, so the other big breakthrough is volumetric. And this is going the other direction completely. Instead of making things really small and accurate when they're close to you, it's about spreading them out and representing bigger objects than just point sources with spatial audio. So this is something that we've had available in traditional panning quite easily, because you just imagine like a 5.1 setup, You've got all these speakers, and if you want to spread it out, you just play a bit more audio through the nearby speakers, and you're going to get a wider sound. But that's not going to work so well in VR. You do have those 3D blend parameters and the spread parameters and that sort of thing in your middleware in your engine, but it can be problematic to try and use those with HRTF because of the inter interaural time difference that I talked about earlier. That introduces a delay in the signal, and when you mix in the original signal, you're going to have a comb filtering effect. So I've got a spectrogram here of kind of the worst case scenario, but this is showing like about one millisecond delay and the banding that you see here, you're really notching out frequencies quite significantly in some cases. And what's really interesting about this is that delay is controlled by the head rotation. So as you rotate your head, you're sweeping a phaser filter which could be a really interesting effect, but it's probably not what you're going for when you're using the spread or the blend parameters. So we wanted to solve this problem correctly in the spatial audio domain. So Oculus Research looked at this problem, and they borrowed some ideas from 3D graphics. And they came up with a really ingenious solution. So the first step was finding a new representation for HRTF. Instead of just having points on a sphere, we needed a properly spherical representation. So we decomposed the HRTF into spherical harmonics. Now, you've probably heard of spherical harmonics because they're the basis of ambisonics. So similar idea, but a very different application. So once we had this spherical representation of the HRTF, we could project any shape onto it and construct a filter in real time that would represent a sound of that size. So you can see here, I've got a spherical sound, and it's projecting a small circle onto the HRTF sphere. But then as that sphere gets closer to the listener, it grows in size. And as the listener enters the sphere, they get completely enveloped in the sound. Now, this is a great tool, but it's not alone going to make things sound big. It is spread for spatial audio, and it can be a great tool for making things sound big, but making big sounds, like making the sound for this volcano, it's not just one volumetric sound. You're going to want to layer up sounds the same way you do. But now you've got spread, which is an excellent tool in the tool belt for really creating amazing spatial audio. Um, oh, we had, this is the test bed that we used for this. So just like the near field, we had a test bed in Unity, same sort of simple scene with the grid and the cube. Um, but I'm actually drawing the projection onto the HRTF sphere, so you can see that um, projection right here. So that's point, and then that's the volumetric. So it's a subtle shift. We've got a few sounds here. Again, Tom's team helped out with this. Um, but what this is doing is it's softening some of those features of the HRTF, particularly the level difference and the frequency response. That those low frequencies that you are hearing and losing those highs, as it spreads around, you get more sort of vision from the right side, less occlusion and more of that high end comes in. But it's all computed correctly from this high resolution spherical harmonic representation. 
And so once we were finished with that, we did a bunch of optimization and we gave it to Tom. So uh, I'm going to go over how we use this. Um, so we used to use point source for everything. That was the tool that we had. So let's say we're doing wind through trees. So we would have a point source of wind through a tree. We'd put it up on the tree. And you know, we might hit those a couple different point sources of different wind through different trees. And it sounded pretty good. This is, I've been doing this for a long time. This is how I did all the, the sound effects in Farlands. It was cool. But there are like holes where the sound's co not coming from. So using this as a spread, you just turn up the radius on the sound, and then it sounds like it's coming from the whole tree now, not just a point. Also, like Pete said before, this isn't like the be all end all solution. You just don't put a point like, I want everything to sound like this. So you just put it there and crank up the radius super big. That's not a great solution. So in this demonstration, so let's say you're standing in a forest, there's a river around you, um, and you take a river loop, you put it there, and you crank up the volumetric radius. That's not going to sound good. That is just one mono loop that's taking up all this space. It doesn't sound like you're in, the, in that space, and it doesn't really sell it. What you would do for something like this, take three different river loops. Let's say one's deep water on one side. You've got like a shoreline, more lapping water in the center, and then a little bit rougher water on the other side, like some rapids there. So three different river loops. And normally this is how I used to do it. This would sound pretty good because it would still sound like the river's all around you. But now you turn up the volumetric radius on these things and it fills in all those spots as well and it sounds even better now. So we're just trying to sell the space that you're in, immerse you more in the space, and this works really, really well. More tools in the tool belt uh, for sound designers. So yeah, and this is just adding the features for spatial audio and really filling out the feature set so you can do everything you need. So you've got the basic point source HRTF, which is your bread and butter of VR. And this is something we've spent a lot of time working on and really getting the frequency response as accurate as possible and the performance really great. You've got reflections as well. So this is something our system models. You can do the shoebox reflections and it really reinforces that directionality and gives you a sense of the size of the space you're in. And we've got our reverb as well, which again is just enhancing all of these features. And last year we added ambisonics, and this is an amazing feature for getting those non-diegetic sounds. And we've got near field now, so that's really, really powerful, especially with touch controllers, just getting those sounds in close and making that accurate. And you've got volumetric for doing those bigger sounds and spreading things out. So now I'm going to talk about how we use all these tools to build a realistic scene to immerse everybody in VR using audio. So realism is super important. You want to model what the room sounds like and what the area sounds like. You can hype the sounds up as much as you want to because we're sound designers and that's what we like to do um, because we want it to be bigger than life. But the way things reflect and the way things are placed have to be realistic in order to sell that experience. Um, and it's all these little things that sell the experience. So if you listen to Near Field and then you turn it off and listen to it, it's not a huge difference. But once you're in VR, that little difference pays off and really sells it as being there. So it's all these little changes and little improvements that make things more immersive. I think it was uh, Abrash last year said, audio in VR is a multiplier. It's not just an additional thing, it's actually an immersion multiplier. So let's talk about building just sounds for a room. I've been in a few ex experiences, and they'll put you in a room with absolutely no sound whatsoever. That is weird and creepy. Um, that, there's no rooms that sound like that. You, you know, we do room tone a lot. So when you're in a room, like even this room, like right now I hear like a computer over here, a vent fan, you can usually hear HVAC, and it's just these different tones in the space. Also, you don't want to do those as headlock stereo because that's not realistic either. So I'm in an empty room. How do I make this sound real? How does it make it sound like I'm actually standing in an empty room? I will take four room tone loops, and I'll put them in my DAW. Um, this, our, our, we have a VST plugin. Also, it's AAX. Works in Pro Tools, works in Nuendo, works in whatever DAW you want. Uh, so I'll take my four loops, and I'll just put them in there, and I'll send them through our plugin. I will make a quad mix out of this, just left front, right front, left rear, right rear. And then I'll say, well, what's the room that I'm in? 
how big is the ceiling? Okay, so this is mostly HVAC sound. So I'll put the, the sound up about 10 feet. I'll move it up there in our plugin. Uh, and then I can just bounce this out as an Ambix file. We don't have to use spread on these points. Since it's a first order ambisonic file, it just spreads it around a little bit, but that's, it's good as this base. And then we'll put that on the player in our plugin in WISE or whatever, or FMOD, whatever you're using. And it just feels like you're in that space then. It's just, just really light room tone. Now, you can also use this for rain and other things. Just like if you're in a cockpit, you can use engine sounds and build your whole room tone in Ambisonics this way. Um, if you're using our plugin on a PC DAW, you can just flip on the Rift headset and you'll have this view. Um, you can actually move the points, your sound points around using touch controllers, and it's a great way to get your pre-mix done uh, before it actually goes in game to test it out. So. I'm going to make this scene right here. What, do, what am I going to do? How am I going to make this sound realistic? Well, first of all, there's going to be wind through that tree. I'm a big fan of wind and trees, you can tell so far. Mm -hmm. um, so the tree rustling, I'll put that on there, and I'll do the volumetric radius on there to make that a little bit bigger. Next thing, bus engine. So it's got to come. It's a point source sound from the bus engine. Then let's say that tire, that tire squeak, the brake squeak on that car, crank that up, point source. Footsteps, you want to make footsteps are on each foot because you don't know where the listener is going to be. I've seen tons of people get down on their hands and knees to check things out, and you want to make sure all the sounds are coming from the right space. What did Hook call it? Yeah, crutch steps and foot voices. You yeah. Avoid that situation. Yeah, don't, don't put everything on the root of your characters. Put it on the actual bones of where the sounds need to come from. Um, the other thing, like say there's a little bit of a rainfall splatter from the umbrella, I'd put a point source on there. And then for the rain overall. So, I would make another ambisonic file, just like I made the room tone file. Just put four tracks of rainfall in your DAW, bounce it out as a first order ambisonic file, and just pop that in there. Now, this is really interesting what's happened to me uh, in the past couple of years since I've been doing VR audio. I, as a sound designer for a long time, I've always listened to sounds. Like when I hear something, and I know everybody else does this too, you're listening to the attack of the sound, sustain of the sound, the, the, the timbre of the sound, everything else about it. Like how can I recreate this later? What I find I do now, not only do that, I listen to where the sounds are coming from, how they're placed, and like what the reflections sound like in the room. Uh, Tricky Van Pete told me, it was like, if you hear a sound, turn your back to it. What does it sound like when it's behind you? I listen to things completely differently than what I used to do. It's pretty exciting, and it's just opened up this new way of doing sound design. Um, yeah, so just like in here for that ambisonic rainfall, so like I did the HVAC sounds for the room tone up high for this, I'm on a city street, so the rainfall splatter is coming really low all around you. If I was in a forest and the rain's hitting the trees, I would put the rainfall sounds up high. Um, it's just interesting things like that that really sell things. So, how do we do music? It's, 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 this is a tough one, because a lot of people are just using stereo music libraries, and it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to get that in there. So, let's say this is the top scene, top, top view of that scene we just went over. We've got a car engine. We've got the trees rustling, footsteps, rain splatter. Since these are all going through our plugin and are spatialized, they're externalized. The sounds sound like they're far away from you. They don't sound like they're playing directly in your ear. They sound like they're in this space. What happens is if you put a stereo music track on top of everything, you've got this headlocked stereo music track that kind of mutes all that spatialization. And it's kind of harder to get a mix that way. And I know you're, sometimes you're stuck on that. You don't have the budget to do custom music and everything else. I get it. We're trying to figure out a solution for this. We don't have anything yet. But there's got to be a better way than just putting stereo music into your files. Um, what I like to do is do at least, bare minimum, do a quad mix. So you do the same thing, put it in your DAW, use our plugin, just do left front, right front, left rear, right rear, quad mix of the music. When it's mixed, make sure there's no front because you don't know which way the player is going to be facing. And then just bounce that out as an Ambix file. That way the music is sitting and it's externalized and it's sitting with the rest of your mix. You can crank the music up louder than you could with just a, with a plain stereo file and it's not destroying this landscape that you've made, this whole virtual world that you've made. Um, so my best explanation for what this is like, so let's say you're walking down a street and you hear cars are all around you and let's say it's even raining out and it's got all this stuff, maybe went through a tree, I like went through trees once again, and then we'll do all of this and then you put on headphones 
What, do you hear all that stuff around you anymore? No, you don't, because you're trying to escape that world reality by putting headphones on and listening to music. In VR, we're trying to make you feel like you're in that world, and that separates you from that. So try to do something like this with the music, bare minimum, to make you feel like you're actually in the space. So, we have been working at Oculus Rex on the new home. Home has a bunch of physics objects. When we made Toy Box, we realized that each object that you interacted with needed a lot more variations on impact sounds than you would normally have in a normal game. We're doing like 10 to 15 variations per surface type for every object in this room, and there's surface types on everything. So when you pick up a ping pong ball and toy box and you dropped it, and if you only had three or four variations, it's just not enough and it doesn't sound realistic, and these little things will actually pull you out of the experience. Uh, the new home is going to be amazing. I can hardly wait for it to come out. We've done a lot of work, a lot of surface types, a lot of variations, just a lot of basic sounds that seem small, but overall it really adds to the immersion and makes you feel like you're really there. So all this stuff is so cool, super excited by everything. It's a bunch of new tools. We're working on more tools. Uh, if you have any requests or anything, please let us know. We're always looking for feedback. We're trying to make everything better. And uh, that's it. We got, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we're doing Q&A right now.